Good morning, 738 here on News Radio 923 and AM 1620. I'm Andrew McKay. It's a Pensacola morning news. I'm just getting word in that we had another apartment structure fire last night on uh, Tumbleweed in Ensley, and we had a couple of apparatus respond on the scene uh, fully staffed, which is great. That means you have enough firefighters to really get the hoses going. They made a big difference. They managed to save possessions, and the structure is going to be able to be repaired, but um, pretty involved fire, and we'll get more information out to you when we find more about it, but uh, nobody was harmed as far as we know so far. Uh, Again, good work to Escambia County Fire Rescue being on the scene and taking care of business. 739 here on News Radio 92.3 and AM 1620. We've got um, public information officer for the Pensacola Police Department, Mike Wood, who even when he is not in town, he still is informed on what's going on and he's able to call in, and we appreciate that. Mike, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, good morning. Hey, good to have you. So um, what you're actually at a public information officer training, um, kind of a master class training, uh, but one of the things that happened there is you got some information about what happened down in Miami, right, with this horrible uh, collapse of this structure, right? Yeah, it was, it was uh, yeah, the one in Surfside. It's kind of a coincidence that we are in a class to learn how to uh, manage a crisis that goes on for several days, which is exactly what happened there. We were fortunate enough to have the PIO from the Miami-Dade uh, fire department in our class and she went over uh what happened with that is it, this is the first time she's been able to talk about it it's still very fresh and uh, she uh she couldn't get to it without getting very emotional it was just a, a horrible scene a horrible situation um you know and they've lost uh, five employees um they, they've just decided to retire immediately uh that's the kind of toll that it's taking on them so um I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, you pray to God that nothing like that ever happens in our area and uh, and have to, you know, if, but if it does, we're able to take care of that. When when you say that they had five employees quit um, because of the stress and the just the psychological difficulty of dealing with the event, is that kind of what, what she was implying? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, they were getting um, bad uh, comments on social media because they had to do things like implode the building that was still standing on mm-hmm. the fourth of july they got a lot of flack over that uh but that was all about timing because of the uh, hurricane that was approaching mm-hmm. and they simply couldn't get to areas that they thought survivors were in because that building may fall down so um it was a, a bad situation there's a lot of uh, issues going on there and just to be there and um and see the families and things like that just takes its toll you know, th- this is a part of uh, emergency response that we don't talk very much about. We, we talk a lot about military having uh, PTSD, dealing with the survivor's guilt, dealing with all, you know, all the stuff they encounter. Um, you, you, of course, had after the January 6th attack, you had police officers take their own lives after the fact, which is a horrible thing because of what they saw encountered dealing with whatever you want to call it. Now you have this, you know, this is not people taking their lives, but this is people leaving the profession because it's just too painful and stressful I, you know it, I, I don't know how you guys deal with it but I know you have policies in place to try to make sure that people who encounter uh, difficult situations get the help they need get counseling right yeah absolutely a program started under Chief Leiter and Chief Randall is continuing that uh, to make sure that our officers get to talk to counselors whenever they need to and then and in some cases it's mandatory that you'll have to go uh, a couple of times a year so that's a that's a very good thing that they've started you know um I, of course always what we have you on to talk about is uh, things that have happened in law enforcement here locally in the last week um i guess you had uh one incident where you had some burglaries were going on and cars were ki- you know people were breaking into cars but you managed to catch them in the vicinity is that right yeah, you know, there was a lot of uh, bur- burglaries in the area of Bayou Boulevard, and uh, last night an officer got out with two individuals near Bayou in Godwinson and uh, found a 9 millimeter handgun on one of them that was reported stolen from a prior vehicle burglary. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, we've always said that's where these weapons are coming from that are on the street that are being used in violent crimes. Is a lot of them are being taken out of vehicles that are in lock. Absolutely. And when, you know, obviously you guys remind people Sheriff Simmons has been on a crusade about this ever since he got elected, the 9 p.m. routine, trying to make sure that people start locking their cars and also get your gun out of your car because that's the primary thing that they're looking for is guns and cash. Um, When you say, you know, just a terminology issue, I know what you mean, but when you say got out with, what do you mean? Uh, They they stop, they get out of the vehicle, and they do what's called a field interview. Um, they ask, you know, who they are, what, what are they doing in that area. Um, you know, an officer, if you do this for any amount of time, uh, you kind of know when something's off, especially in an area where vehicles have been broken into. 
Absolutely. So you put two and two together. Uh, you know, it's different if it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon versus 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, people are walking around neighborhoods. Right. Um, the officers are going to stop uh, and, and uh, see what they're doing. So, yeah, just a, just a term you'll hear, uh, you know, our fa- folks use that got out with and just means getting out of the car, you know, and doing the work that they do, as you say, to interview somebody who really, you know, why are you here at this time of night? Uh, you also had a, a vehicle theft uh, from Sacred Heart. Is that right? Yeah, that was three nights ago. A vehicle was stolen. Um, officers were able to spot that vehicle a short time later. They tried to stop it. It fled. Uh, the officers did not pursue. And I believe that happened a couple more times where it did did not stop, uh, but eventually it was found abandoned. And uh, canine officer Brandon Williams and his uh, and his dog Foster were able to track that individual to a uh, front porch of a home. He was sitting there at a home that he did not live at, what? and uh, they were able to make the arrest. What, I mean, what was he pretending to live there, sit there, laying down, passed out? Do we know? I would assume that he was uh, wanted the officer to believe that he lived there. He did make a uh, he did tell the officer that the person they were looking for left in a separate vehicle, but uh, the officers determined that wasn't true. Those dogs are amazing. <laughs> I mean, they are amazing what the canines can do. You um you guys also had an event um at uh, what the Grenada apartment complex that involved a shooting over what a like fifty bucks of a drug deal or something like this. Yeah, you know, most of these shootings, I would probably say 90%, if not more than that, are related to narcotics. This one was no different. We were just fortunate that it was a non-life-threatening wound to, I believe it was his ankle, um, and an arrest was made the next day. Is this the one where it was like the brother carried the victim across the street to the salon or something like that? Well, it was a couple of blocks up on the same side of the road from Granada Apartments to a, uh, a barber pool up near uh, Ninth and Fairfield. Okay. <laughs> just I don't I don't pretend to understand all the things that happened, Mike. Uh, earlier this week, I was talking to uh, Sheriff Simmons about something that I had been told uh, was in existence: the Rumbler, which is, I guess, a lower frequency kind of pulse wave that alerts drivers that a vehicle has its sirens on and is coming, but is maybe a little bit farther away for them to be able to hear the regular noise. It's, uh, you know, I don't know too much about it. He was telling me it was a relatively new technology. Um, And then Mark, our uh, news guy, said that he actually experienced it the next day. Does PPD have this on your cruisers? Yes. All of the cruisers, I believe since 2011, have those. And it's more of a a siren with bass in it. And, uh, you know, if you've heard cars drive by with a lot of bass going, you can you can hear that far away, and you're not real sure what vehicle it's coming from, but you can you can sure hear it. And uh, so the uh, emergency vehicles have adopted that, and it works very well. Now, is it? Pardon my ignorance on this subject. Is it ongoing as long as you have the sirens running, or is it something that the officer manually pulses periodically when approaching an intersection? Uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious of the mechanism here because I want people to know if they experience it. I want them to know what they're experiencing so that they can take appropriate action. Well, they're hear the regular siren. They're going to hear that first, and the officer has control. Uh, over the rest of it himself. He can do that manually. It, okay. You know, it really depends on how the car is configured. Okay. Okay, fair enough. And last thing is we always like to ask you if you have a cop myth of any kind to share with us because it seems like there's far more misconception about policing than there is accurate uh, reality. So you have a cop myth for us this week? Yeah, this one is actually a myth about driver's license. Uh, driver's licensing. Uh, the myth is that if you have a bad record, let's say in Florida, and you decide to move to Minnesota and get a Minnesota driver's license that um, you have a clean slate. Um, that's not true. The states talk to each other. They share information, and uh, they're going to know your driving history. So that's a, that's a total myth. So they will check your background when you go to apply for a license in a state. They will look in the state you moved from. Absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah, that is useful because, I mean, <laughs> it's the way it should be, right? But, um, you know, whether it actually happens is the question. So that's good to know. Uh, Pensacola Police Department Public Information Officer Mike Wood. Mike, as always, thank you for the information. Thanks for being there for us. We certainly appreciate the work, sir. Thank you.